Fukushima is continuing to deteriorate, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. In fact, it's reached the point where the Atomic Energy Agency of, of Japan, or their version of ours, has said it's, it's an emergency, or words to that effect. Kevin Camps is on the line with us. He's the radioactive waste watchdog at beyondnuclear.org, the guys who keep track of this stuff. Kevin, welcome back to the program. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, no, no robotic pigeons here. This is serious stuff. Well, it's, uh, as you say, it's an emergency. The, uh, the groundwater is severely contaminated, and incredibly, the news headlines just keep rolling day after day. We're looking at double-digit percent increases in radioactivity levels in the groundwater on a daily basis at this point. And this has really been going on for months now. But now we come to find out, surprise, surprise, that Tokyo Electric wasn't exactly telling the world everything there was to be told. And now there are reports that this leakage has been going on to a greater or lesser extent for two and a half years since the very beginning of the catastrophe. Whoa. So how much, put this in some kind of context, how much, how much radioactive cesium does it take to cause how many cases of cancer and, and how much cesium, just to pick one element, uh, or pick whatever you want, has been emitted, you know, has been dumped into the, into the Pacific Ocean? Well, cesium-137 and cesium-134 are human muscle seekers. They're mistaken by the human body for potassium. And so they go to the heart, for example. They go to the reproductive organs in humans as well. Uh, massive amounts of cesium. Uh, tritium, I'm more familiar with the figures on the tritium discharges. Tokyo Electric has admitted to 20 trillion to 40 trillion becquerels of radioactive tritium release into the ocean. And they hasten to add, it's no big deal, it's a big ocean, it'll dilute. What they leave out is the bioconcentration factor, which means once it gets into the food chain, it concentrates up the food chain. Some of the most recent articles out of the likes of The Guardian in London is about the uh, tragedy, to put it mildly, visited upon the Fukushima fishing fleets, which are, you know, some of these fishermen, their families have been fishing since time immemorial, and it's over for them. I mean, uh, they're making money by still cleaning up tsunami debris, and they get some kind of a token payment from the national government for what they've lost because of this uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear catastrophe. But that 40 trillion becquerels of tritium figure, a becquerel is a radioactive disintegration per second. What that means is 40 trillion radioactive disintegrations per second, per second, per second, and that's going to go on in the case of tritium for 240 years is a good figure to use because that's how long it'll be hazardous in the environment. And the body treats tritium how? Tritium is radioactive hydrogen and can go anywhere in the human body that hydrogen goes, which is everywhere, right down to the DNA molecule. And the nuclear establishment worldwide, which is more of a nuclear mafia, if, if you want my opinion, We'll say tritium's not a big deal. It simply passes through the human body quite rapidly, and then it's gone. Well, that's not true. There's a phenomenon called organically bound tritium, where it can stick around for a good long time in your body. Right. And they also, in their deceptions and half-truths, will say that tritium is a relatively weak emitter of beta radiation. Well, uh, it's all relative, isn't it? When you're in a DNA molecule, <laughs> a relatively weak beta emission will be like a, a small little uh, hand grenade in your DNA molecule. And that's where the cancers start. That's where the birth defects start. That's where the genetic damage starts. Do we, so what's the fate and future of Fukushima, first of all? Well, we've been talking, you and I, for two and a half years about um, the danger of Fukushima Daiichi Unit Number 4 simply collapsing. It's so damaged from the explosion. And there's some 200 tons of irradiated nuclear fuel in that storage pool. Uh, in the context of what's going on now with this groundwater flooding of the site, because one of their mitigation measures, which is pretty uh, not very well thought out, was building a, a seawall by freezing the ground. And guess what? The groundwater is piling up behind the seawall. It's actually overtopping the seawall at the rate of 300 tons per day that's flowing into the ocean, radioactive water. But by backing up the water under the entire site, they are turning the ground into quicksand, and that's causing less uh, stability, more instability. And there are structural engineers and nuclear engineers warning 
that may be the the final straw that's needed to topple not only Unit 4, but perhaps some of those other uh, destroyed units. With and, their, and, oh, go ahead. With their high-level radioactive waste uh, stored in pools 50 feet up in the air. Yeah, the 50 feet up in the air. When you said, you know, Unit 4 has all this radioactive material in their pool and they're concerned that Number 4 is going to collapse, a lot of people, they hear pool, they think hole in the ground, they may think it's going to collapse on top of it. Wouldn't that be nice? It'll just cover it up. No, the, the pool is actually, what, five stories up, ten stories up, something like that? Yes, it was uh, designed that way for ease of removing nuclear fuel from the operating reactor core into the high-level radioactive waste storage pool. But the situation is they can't support a crane to lift 100-ton loads of irradiated fuel in transfer casks. That's the radiation shielding out of the pool and onto the ground. That's why they're stuck. They can't get the waste out. Senator Wyden, back in April of 2012, visited Fukushima Daiichi, put on a radiation protection suit, toured the site, and came back to the United States, called on the U.S. government at the highest levels to get over there and deploy the full resources of the U.S. government. Because if that pool goes down and that fuel is still in there, it'll be on fire and the radioactivity releases will dwarf what has happened thus far at Fukushima Daiichi. There's no radiological containment around the pools. In fact, there's not even a, a roof over them anymore. They're open air at this point. And the prevailing winds and the prevailing ocean currents take water from the coast of Japan where? To North America. I mean, uh, within days of the Fukushima Daiichi catastrophe beginning, we were getting uh, fallout coming down in rain in the United States, not in insignificant quantities. And also, of course, the, uh, the seafood, um, not only does the ocean's currents bring the radioactivity this way, but also uh, the sea life itself, the bluefin tuna, uh, migrated from Japan to North America and carried the radioactive cesium in its flesh over here. Wow. Not a good time to be eating tuna, um, it, it would seem. Is, it, has there been any has determination of, the, of radiation in seafood on the west coast of the U.S.? Well, um, it's thrown upon the American citizen to do that for themselves. Our federal government seems to be busy with other things. But the situation is the same in Japan. Ordinary citizens. Yes, uh, tuna and uh, sea kelp, there is uh, radioactivity. In wow. Kevin Camps, the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. You can log on to their site and read all about it, beyondnuclear.org. Kevin, thank you. Patricia in Sacramento. Hey, Patricia, what's up? Hey, Tom. Uh, the other day I called Senator Boxer's office uh, because she is the chair of the Environmental Committee, mm -hmm. and I had asked them about this, uh, the news articles I've been re reading about Fukushima, right. and they had referred me to the Nuclear Regulatory Committee. I that's right, that's Commission, the NRC. Yeah, yeah Commission, sorry. And uh, I don't remember the name of the gentleman I spoke to, but I, I told him, I said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the public, and I just wanted to know I'm concerned about this and how this will affect us, and I asked them, what are you doing to ensure, because this is not just about Japan, you know, this is going to affect everybody. Right. What are you doing to be involved? And basically his response was, it concerned me, Tom, it was almost to the effect that, well, you know, we're not, it, it's not a, we're not, we're seeing this as a problem, but because the Pacific Ocean is so vast that this radioactive material would be you know, it made it sound like it would be so minuscule that it would just, it wouldn't even affect us. Right. That this is more of a concern for Japan. This is not a concern for the U.S. or any other surrounding uh, areas. If you're talking and about I, swimming in the water, you know, going to the beach in, in Santa Monica, he's right. The odds of, you know, any significant radioactive contamination making its way all the way across the Pacific intact at high levels are fairly low, and one of the reasons why is that many of these radioactive elements, uh, the, the, the higher isotopes, the heavier ones, sink into the bottom of the sea. And the ones, the middle, middle range ones, the, the cesiums and the tritiums, well, tritium's a very light one, actually. Um, tritium may actually go into the atmosphere. Cesium and things like that, they get eaten. You know, the, the plant matter, the plankton, the all, which is the ocean, is just filled with. I mean, the ocean is just a, a sea of, if you took just a drop of seawater and looked at it under a microscope, you'd see it's filled with life. And all this life in the ocean, they are, are just woofing up 
these radioactive elements because the radioactive elements mimic other elements. As Kevin pointed out, radioactive cesium, the body thinks that it's potassium. Potassium is essential to every muscle in our body, particularly our hearts, and, and so it takes it up as if it was potassium. Um, I'm forgetting the one that, that the body thinks is calcium, but there's another one that the body thinks is calcium, and it takes it up and puts it in, the, in your bones. And, and, and on and on and on. So the plankton, the, the plant matter within, you know, two, three, four, five hundred miles of Japan is heavily contaminated with this stuff. That plant matter then gets eaten by small fish. The small fish get eaten by medium-sized fish. The medium-sized fish get eaten by big fish. The big fish then get eaten by us. That's called bioaccumulation. And so what is happening is that, you know, the, the, the radiation from an area that could be several square miles gets, or cubic miles in the case of the ocean, gets, uh, uh, you know, gets absorbed by the, by the plant matter, which then gets eaten by a whole bunch of fish. But ultimately, you know, one tuna or one large fish could have several miles worth of, of Fukushima, you know, water radiation that started out very dilute. And my concern, and, and, and uh, I guess the NRC is passing the buck on this because they're saying, well, this should be the USDA or something, or maybe the states. But my concern is the food supply. And uh, I went out and bought a, a Geiger counter. When we lived in Germany, uh, we moved there the week after Chernobyl melted down back in 86. And I used to walk through the supermarket with a Geiger counter. And which uh, always embarrassed my wife and got uh, dirty stares from the people in the in the supermarket. But you'd be walking along and it would go tick 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 tick, and then as I passed the mushrooms, it'd go brrrr like that because the mushrooms were because uh, mushrooms just absorb cesium like there's no tomorrow, and and um, the milk would set it off. I mean, it was pretty amazing. And I have one here, and I'd, I've tried to take it out to restaurants before, but Louise won't go with me if I take my Geiger counter. Well, I, I was going to ask you something very quickly, Tom. Do you remember when uh, the first, uh, the incident, uh, several months after Fukushima initially happened, uh, wasn't there a place, I don't know if it was Berkeley or some area where the scientists were uh, studying the levels of radioactive material in the milk? Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were, they uh, were looking at iodine. Yeah, they were looking at iodine, radioactive iodine, and it was showing up. Um, and iodine, of course, is being transported by the wind and the rain. And because it comes across as a, a, in a gaseous form. And it has a relatively short half-life, but it looks like these things are still emitting this stuff continuously. So if I lived on the West Coast, as you do, I would. there are groups of people who are getting together, and they're sampling food, and they're sampling the air, and things like this. And I would find one of those groups. You might want to start at Beyond Nuclear, or just ask, ask the folks at beyondnuclear.org who to talk to. And I would also seriously consider investing in a Geiger counter, you know, a fairly sensitive one. They're, they're only two, three hundred dollars. I mean, I realize that's a lot of money for a lot of people, but it's, you know, if it prevents you from getting cancer. Uh, and, and going out and checking the food. I think this is much more concern. And then the other thing I would do is I would be taking um, I would, liquid dulse. You can buy at vitaminshop.com. There's liquid dulse. Dr. Bragg makes it. And it is... Um, const- it's iodine. It's iodine from, from, from red seaweed. Dulse is a red seaweed. And if I lived on the West Coast, I, I do take it every day anyway. I have for decades. And just a couple of drops. And that way it keeps your, your thyroid saturated with iodine. So if you're exposed to radioactive iodine, your body doesn't absorb it. And uh, because the, the, there's a, a fair amount of epidemiological stuff that suggests that the the wild epidemic of hypo and hyper, but mostly hypothyroidism among people in their 40s and 50s and 60s in the United States right now is the reason, because right, Synthroid is the most prescribed drug in America. It's, it's a supplement for the thyroid. And that, that that might be because of the above ground radioactive tests in the 1940s and 50s um, leading to you know, contamination of our milk by radioactive iodine and that that kind of burned up people's thyroids. Make it sense, Patricia? Absolutely. I have hypothyroid, so <laughs> I'm right Bingo. on that. Bingo. So you know what I'm talking about. Okay, Patricia, thank you very much for the call, and good luck. And if you learn anything interesting, give us a shot. Let us know.